September 1938, Czechoslovakia. Adolf Hitler, the Chancellor of Germany, threatens to unleash a European war unless the Sudetenland, a border area of Czechoslovakia, on which the ethnic German population lives, is ceded to Germany. The leaders of Britain, France, Italy and Germany hold a conference in Munich between the 29th and 30th of September 1938 and agree to the German annexation of the Sudetenland in exchange for a pledge of peace from Hitler. The Czechoslovaks are not even invited to this conference, and less than six months later, on the 15th of March 1939, in violation of the Munich Agreement, Nazi Germany invades and occupies the Czech provinces of Bohemia and Moravia. Adolf Hitler himself arrives in Prague, and on the 16th of March 1939, by a proclamation from Prague Castle, establishes the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. More than 118,000 Jews living in the Protectorate find themselves under Nazi domination. One of them is Irit Polachova. Irit Polachova was born on the 12th of July, 1929 in Prague, then Czechoslovakia. Irit was the only child of Elisabeth and Hanusz Polach, who nicknamed her Dieter. The family, who spoke both German and Czech, lived in a rented apartment in Prague together with a maid. While Dita's mother, Elisabeth, was a housewife, her father was a lawyer working for the State Pension Institute. His work included traveling to the courts in many cities of Czechoslovakia, where he represented workers' interests. Dita's grandfather, Johann Polach, was a member of the Social Democratic Party and became a senator of Czechoslovak National Parliament. Dita had a happy childhood. She enjoyed going to school, walking in the park, as well as playing with her friends. When on the 30th of January, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany by the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, Dieter was only three years old. The Nazi regime quickly began to restrict the civil and human rights of the Jewish people, and less than two months after Hitler became a chancellor, the first concentration camp, Dachau, was established in March 1933. Thousands of Jews fled from Germany. Among them were friends of Dieter's parents, who came to Prague and told the Polachs about what was happening to the Jews in Germany. Until then, Dieter did not know that she and her parents were Jews, as her family was secular and not religious. Dieter could see how worried her parents became, and she could often hear them saying words such as Nazism, Adolf Hitler, persecution of Jews, or the Nuremberg Laws, which became the legal basis for the racist anti-Jewish policy in Germany. Things changed for the worse in Czechoslovakia in late summer 1938 when Hitler annexed the Sudetenland, where the ethnic German population of Czechoslovakia lived. This border area of Czechoslovakia also contained the Czechoslovak army's defensive positions in the event of a war with Germany. Dieter's parents started to think about immigration as they feared that Adolf Hitler was not interested only in the Sudetenland. However, very few countries accepted Jewish immigrants, and emigration became even more difficult when on the 15th of March 1939, less than six months after the annexation of the Sudetenland, Nazi Germany invaded and occupied the remaining Czech parts of Czechoslovakia, establishing the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which by contrast to the Sudetenland consisted mostly of ethnic Czechs. Immediately after the Nazis started to occupy the whole country, they passed new anti-Jewish laws which were designed to exclude Jewish people from society and restrict their livelihood. Their accounts were frozen, and they were forbidden to sell companies and real estate, which were confiscated and taken over by the Germans. In all, the Germans seized about half a billion dollars worth of Jewish property in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. The Polachs were not an exception. Two German officers came to their home, situated in a modern building in Prague, and ordered them to move out. Another blow for Dieter's family was when her father, a lawyer, was dismissed from work as Jewish teachers, lecturers, army officers and doctors were dismissed from government jobs. Dieter's life changed completely too, as the Jews were banned from entering certain streets, squares, parks, woods and other public places. From the 1st of September 1939, when the Second World War began, the Jews were not allowed to stay outdoors after 8 o'clock in the evening. From August 1940 onwards, Jewish children were banned from attending public and private schools. Because Jewish parents wanted their children to continue studying, they created private study groups of five to seven children who were taught clandestinely by a Jewish teacher. Since being evicted from their home, the Polachs lived in one room of a two-room apartment which they had to share with another family. 
From November 1940, new laws, decrees, guidelines and regulations increasingly restricted the civil and human rights of the Jews in the Protectorate. Jews were not allowed to leave their municipalities, even temporarily, without special permission. They were not allowed to visit libraries, theatres and cinemas, pubs or cafes, swimming pools, and other sporting and entertainment facilities. Jews had their radio sets taken away and were not even allowed to keep pets. When traveling by city public transport or trains, they were confined to standing in the last carriage. The Jews were even limited in their choice of food, and shopping times for them were limited to two hours twice a day, and later only two hours once per day. However, there was still an oasis of fun and hope in a desert of oppression, where Jewish children of Prague could meet, Hagibor. It was a playground which consisted of tennis courts, volleyball courts or running track, where Jewish children could play games and participate in competitions. All was organized by Freddy Hirsch, a German Jewish athlete, sports teacher, and Zionist youth movement leader. Because by the time that Hagibor was functioning, the Nazis had forbidden the Jews from traveling by public transport, Dieter had to walk for an hour to Hagibor and back. The systematic deportation of Jews from the territory of the Protectorate started in October 1941 with transports to the Lodz Ghetto, which was located in German-occupied Poland. By the 3rd of November the same year, 5,000 Jews were deported to the ghetto. One of them was Dieter's beloved uncle Ludwig. Soon after his deportation, the family received a card announcing his death. Only 277 out of 5,000 Jews deported to the Lodz Ghetto survived. Uncle Ludwig's widow, Aunt Mania, who was not a Jew, did not obey the law forbidding non-Jews to have contact with Jews, and kept helping Dieter and her parents, bringing food and other necessities. In November 1941, Reinhard Heydrich, the Nazi architect of the Holocaust, established the Theresienstadt Ghetto, which was located in the fortress town of Theresien, in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. The first transport of Czech Jews arrived in the same month. At that time, Dieter's father was employed as a clerk in one of the departments of the Jewish Community Center. Another department had the task, ordered by the Nazis, to make up lists of people to be deported. Thanks to Dieter's father's job, their own deportation was delayed for a few months. However, Dieter's grandparents were deported to Theresienstadt in July 1942. Dieter, along with her parents, followed them in November the same year. Because the Nazis had taken everything from them, the Polachs came to Theresienstadt with some clothes, a blanket, a pillow, metal dishes, and some non-perishable food. When Dieter and her parents arrived in the ghetto, it was so overcrowded that they had to sleep on the floor inside the ramparts. Grandmother Polach found them there. She had sad news. Their grandfather, Johann Polach, had passed away only three weeks before. Conditions in the camp were harsh. Lack of water and electricity, overcrowding, bedbugs, fleas and lice, and above all, no privacy. Food was distributed to all inmates from the central kitchens. It consisted of a portion of soup, usually made of lentil powder, and some potatoes or a dumpling, never fruit or vegetables. A quarter loaf of bread for two days and a spoonful of jam were distributed in the rooms. The prisoners were hungry, many were sick. 200 inmates were dying daily, diseases were rampant. Men and women lived in separate barracks. They slept in three-tiered wooden bunks. There were also several separate homes for girls and boys. In their rooms, there were usually a table and a bench in addition to the bunks. The prisoners spent their waking hours either at work, queuing for a meal, or on their bunk. All prisoners aged 14 to 60 or 65 had to work. Most were involved in war production for Germany or in the vegetable gardens. However, the vegetables they produced were not for the prisoners, but for the Nazi personnel. Dieter was one of those that worked in the vegetable gardens. Those who did not work, mostly the elderly people, received 60% less food than heavy laborers. 92% of deaths were among those over 60, and almost all elderly prisoners who were not deported to other extermination camps, such as Auschwitz, died at Theresienstadt. Younger people did not face starvation, although many lost weight and were often sick. The ghetto was administered by the Jewish elders, among them Freddy Hirsch, who was head of the children and youth department. His intention was to keep the children somewhat insulated from the harsh conditions in the ghetto, so that they would not succumb to demoralization. It was he who managed to find for them better housing in the so-called Heims. 
Although education was forbidden, the prisoners, many of them former professors, scientists and artists, continued to clandestinely teach the children in the Heims. While in the beginning, Theresienstadt served as a ghetto for the Czech Jews, in June 1942, the first German and Austrian Jews arrived. Dutch and Danish Jews came later, in the beginning of 1943. On the 26th of October, 1942, less than 48 hours after the arrival of the last transport, from Theresienstadt to Treblinka, the SS dispatched the first transport to Auschwitz, carrying 1,866 persons. Upon arrival, SS officials selected 247 people, mostly men, to be registered as prisoners. The remaining 1,619 were killed in the gas chambers. In order to convince the German population that the deportees were bound for resettlement, most Jews from the German Reich itself were dispatched to the east by passenger trains. Jews in the German-occupied east fared far worse. German authorities generally did not give the deportees food or water, even when the journey was long. The hapless victims had to wait for days on railroad spurs for other trains to pass. Packed into sealed cattle cars and suffering from overcrowding, they endured intense heat during the summer and freezing temperatures in the winter. The Polachs were selected for deportation to the working camp in the east, as they had been told in December 1943. The transport was so overcrowded that men, women, children and elderly people could not sit and had to stand for about two days until they reached their destination, Auschwitz. Aside from a bucket which was overflowing within a few hours, there were no sanitary facilities. The stench of urine and excrement added to the humiliation and suffering of the deportees. Lacking food and water and proper ventilation, many of the deportees also died before the trains reached their destinations. Armed police guards accompanied the transport, and they had orders to shoot anyone who tried to escape. When they reached Auschwitz, they did not know that the worst was yet to come. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Please help us to create more videos by clicking on the donation link. Thank you, and see you next time on the channel.